All right, we are we're live. We are live on the internet. So we'll do it live. Says Dr. Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. I think it was live, right? Everybody needs attention. Hey. What class do you have second? Second? Do you have a class second? Business, control business, leads. Why? I was thinking about something. I want an excuse to get out of it. Oh, why would they assign so much stuff? Same as him. Study all. Please get me out of there. Study all. Why would they assign so much stuff? Why would they assign so much stuff? Why? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's a situation awesome. that causes me the, 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 the Are you overwhelmed? Uh, I just had to Do not know. Uh, oh, I mean, I don't think they are on there. Uh, to open today. So there's a reason why we watch Parking that. Lot Parking lot rage is what it's called. Um, um, yesterday we talked about different personality traits, but one thing uh, we did not talk about is anger. Um, this word catharsis. This word catharsis means letting it all out. Sometimes people deal with stress um, through anger. 
uh, especially type A personalities. That's tend to be how they uh, deal with their stress. They kind of let it all out. Um, and today what we're going to do is talk about many different coping strategies, uh, many different ways that you cope with stress. But anger is definitely one of them. Um, it is, let me hide this, recommended uh, that you deal with anger-related stress by diffusing it with exercise, talking, forgiveness, and not uh, catharsis, which is letting it all out, screaming, punching, ramming your car into the back of someone else's car. That's not healthy behavior, but sure looks fun. So what we're talking about today, let me skip forward a couple slides, is coping. Um, on this slide, it tells you everything that we're going to talk about in the next section. Uh, we're going to talk about um, how to go from coping to actually thriving, um, and it promotes health. Uh, if you can healthily deal with your stress, you will become a more healthy individual. And there's a lot of different things uh, that go along with coping, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, in dealing with stress, here are some ways to reduce the effects of stress. Uh, you can address the stressors. Yesterday, you, I showed you guys a list of what you said were stressful situations, like school, homework, tests, sports, college a lot of different things. One way to cope with the stress or address the stressful situation is to address the stressor. stressor. My mother is stressing me out. So you actually you know, are like, okay, what do I have to do with my mother? What do I have to address with my mother to address that sort of stressful situation? I have a test coming up. It stresses me out. How can I address that? Um, you know, you focus on what it is that is stressing you out, and you try to address that situation. Work it out, talk it out, um, come up with a plan, whatever it is. The woman in the video was obviously stressed about losing the parking spot. Um, she should have addressed that by just finding another parking spot, perhaps. Uh, you can soothe your emotions. You can deal with your actual emotions about the stress. If you don't want to deal with your mom, be like, okay, my mom causes that sort of emotion in me. How can I deal with my emotions? Um, you can increase your sense of control over your stressors. Do something that makes make you feel a little bit more in control of the situation. Um, a lot of times we feel like stressful situations are beyond our control, but if you can find a way to take back some control over your stressors, um, it'll it'll make you feel less stressed about them. Not with my brother. Not with your brother? No, he does not listen to me. Mm. Um, and instead of being, uh, or instead of being pessimistic about the situation, try to be optimistic. And we'll talk about that later today too. And then if all else fails, you can always get social support of some kind. Help from peeps. Um, some other ways to reduce. Four. Like. F-O-R. F-O-R? The suggestion was or. <laughs> oh, I see. Optimism or pet. Yeah. Um, uh, we will talk about aerobic exercise and communities of faith, I think, in this PowerPoint. But other ways that you can deal with your lever levels of stress and improve your health at the same time, relaxation and meditation and alternative medicines, acupuncture, um, Reiki. If anyone has ever done Reiki, it's pretty, pretty weird. Is it like a... I don't know. They do it. They do it in Waverly. They, 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 they just. You lay down, and this woman goes like this over you with her hands, and then she has this music playing, and then she takes these little finger symbols, and like does things like this all around your body. It's very strange, but it's weirdly therapeutic. And she's like, I can tell, and like she knew nothing about me, but it's almost like weird psychic. Like she felt energy coming off my body, and she knew things about me from the energy that she was pulling out. It is very strange. That would be an alternative medicine. Not in Waverly. 
I did that, yeah. Why? Um, I, I had... Mac, Mac. Oh, I was a little stressed out. Research. And I was, I was, was before school started, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go get a massage. So I called them to, to get a massage, but while I... Instead of the massage. Yeah, and... You know, they say to close your eyes just to be totally relaxed, and I did. But at one point, I opened them, and I wish I wouldn't have because she's like, like dancing like that. And then, I, then I, of course, I like I could not get back to relax because I was laughing so hard, like in my head. But I, and then when she broke out the finger symbols and the rocks, she takes rocks and like massages your face with these rocks. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it was very interesting. We we I could we we could see we could see. Yeah. You put those like on your back, like soothe that like muscles like that, not massage your face. If you need a face massage, you know, rocks rocks are good. Uh, yes, perhaps we shall do a Reiki session. Um, uh, two different ways you can cope with stress. If we're we're not talking necessarily about actual strategies here, like. Reiki or aerobic exercise or talking to someone, but these are more methods, if you want to think of like two different ways, methodology, or two different ways to look at stress. One thing, if you have stress that you can do is you actually focus on the problem called problem-focused uh, coping, which means you're actually trying to reduce the stressors by working out the conflict or tackling a difficult project. You actually deal with the problem, like the actual stressor. Um, so you have a very difficult test coming up. You have a lot of stress about moving to college or what you're going to major in or the whole college move in general. You're, in order to cope with that sort of stressor, you try to work through that conflict. Be like, okay, I just have to figure out here what I'm going to do next year. Um, where am I going to live and how I'm going to do it? And just try to work through that process and be like, okay, I'm living here gonna do this like you just work through the process you tackle the difficult project I have that stressful test coming up let me just deal with getting prepared for that test so it doesn't stress me out anymore problem focused coping you focus hundred percent just on the problem when you do things like that one risk uh, that can happen is you totally um, your emotions can get a little out of control any emotional distress that you're feeling about it isn't being addressed <laughs> at all because instead of actually worrying about or thinking about what you're feeling. You're worried about the stressor 100%. So it can actually sometimes make you emotion, more emotional. You know, if you're forced to sit there all night and try to think about what it's going to be like moving out next year and living on your own, and it makes you super, super emotional, that's a risk. Yes, you're focusing on the problem, but you're kind of putting yourself in a more emotional state. Especially when you have to deal with something where you can't change. Like, I can't change the way my mom is. That's just the way she is. That might not be the best way to solve your problem because if that's just the way a person is, sometimes we can't do anything about that stressor. So the other thing you can do is instead of worrying about what it is that's actually stressing you is worry about the emotions, the emotion-focused coping. And that's where you deal with your emotions. Don't worry about what it is that's stressing you out. You just worry about how you're feeling. Well, okay. I, let me think. Um, I only did it last year for conference. And I think what I did is do it through Google. And I had to just like copy and paste in all the emails to real people's email addresses. Oh yeah, that might have been a problem because I remember doing the copy and paste, and some people didn't get it because they didn't have their email or something. So the AD didn't have the code. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, problem with emotion focused coping is you're not at all addressing the problem. You're not at all dealing with the fact that you have a test coming up. You're only dealing with how you're feeling about it. <coughs> okay. A um, couple things we need to talk about here are uh, learned helplessness versus personal control. 
Normally, um, creatures try to escape or end painful situations, but experience can make us lose hope. So you're in a very stressful situation naturally. We want to try to escape from that painful situation, that, that bad stress. Um, and a lot of times that can make us feel like there is no hope. Like there's nothing I can do about the fact that my brother stresses me out. Um, and then we can get into this sort of free falling uh, control thing here. So they did a couple uh, experiments with dogs where they shocked them. Um, and eventually, if you shock a dog enough times, the dog finally just gives up on trying to escape if he knows, if he feels like he can't escape. And um, what happens is, is kind of called learned helplessness. And we see this a lot of times in education, too, with students. Um, learned helplessness is when you decline to help yourself after repeated attempts to do so have failed. I see this a lot of times uh, with some of my students like in Spanish too. Uh, there's a couple in particular that they just refuse to try to study because they have studied in the past and they continue to fail. So it's just like, you know what, I'm just going to fail. And they just have this sort of, they decline to actually do anything to try to help themselves out from now on because in the past, um, when they have tried, they have still failed. So they get this learned helplessness. No matter what I do, I'm going to fail because I failed before and I was trying before and I didn't, you know, it didn't help me. So you get that kind of learned helplessness. Um, some of you might have that way in athletics. Like no matter how hard I train, no matter how hard I, use, I do that or I, I try to do that, I can never, you know, break that two-minute mark or whatever it is. I don't know. Um, because you've attempted to do so in the past and you failed. So that's always a risk with uh, coping is you just kind of give up, learned helplessness. Uh, personal control is when people are given choices, not too many, and they thrive. When we're given control over a situation, it, it, we get better with it. And I think that's on the next slide. Joke. Yeah. Um, so here's the experiment. I have to explain the experiment before we talked about level of control. So they have these little rats in these boxes, and they, um, the rats on the left in the middle receive these shocks. The rat on the left was able to turn off the shocks for both of the rats, so he had control over whether or not the shocks were going to happen. The middle rat had absolutely no control. And then the rat on the end, he was just a control rat that they compared everything to. So which one of these rats do you think had worse uh, stress and health problems? The executive rat that was able to control the shocks, the subordinate rat who had absolutely no control over getting shocked or not, or the control rat? The the only, uh, this middle guy, had he had ulcers. Um, he had uh, higher blood pressure. Um, he actually, the fat cells got larger at the time they did this experiment. He was uh, not only feeling more stress, he had all these different health effects re uh, related to the stress. And it had nothing to do with how much he got shocked or how often he got shocked or anything like that. It had mostly just to do with the fat, because the other, the rat was getting shocked just as often but it was the fact that that rat had absolutely no control over his situation. So when you perceive you have no control over your situation, your stress is greater. And some of you can probably think about that. You have a test coming up. If you feel you have some sort of control over studying or you know the material or there's things that you can do to be prepared for that, you feel a little bit better than a situation where I'm really stressed because maybe a health problem is happening in your family and technically there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. You have no control over that. So that stress is going to affect you stronger. And that's the perceived level of control. It's not necessarily the severity of the stress. It's also um, the level of control we have over that stress. There are two different types of control. And I feel like these have popped up somewhere in your learning before. These are called locuses of control. An internal locus of control is we feel that we are in charge of ourselves and our circumstances. 
through maturity uh, in high school students, I see this a lot. Middle school students might not be able to do this so much. As, as a high school student matures, you see you guys become a lot more, um, you feel that you are in charge of yourself and your circumstances. If you fail a psychology test, some of you have an internal locus of control where you believe you are in charge of that situation. The opposite is external locus of control. We, we picture that a force outside of ourselves controls our fate. You failed a psychology test, it was Mrs. Huff's fault. External locus of control. It was because you lost a race, well it was because this team did that. External locus of control. Internal locus of control, you have control over your own situation. External, you believe outside presences have control over the situation. And sometimes they do. Sometimes the things that we experience are beyond our control. They are external. Sometimes things are internal. This is sort of a perception thing. Um, if we have too much internal locus of control, you got to have a balance of both of these. If we feel like absolutely everything is in charge of ourselves and our circumstances, we blame ourselves for everything. We blame ourselves for bad events. We have the illusion that we have the power to prevent bad things from happening. You know, a car accident happens and you're like, it's my fault, it's my fault, it's my... Maybe not. Maybe there was an external factor. If you have too much of an internal locus of control, you, you tend to blame yourself for everything. And maybe you can see that in people that you know, people that constantly kind of put everything in themselves. And then the opposite of that is the external. Um, it has nothing to do with your initiative. You have no motivation to achieve because everything depends on other people. You have a lot more anxiety th there also because anything that you're trying to do is all dependent on other people. You don't develop a willpower yourself because it doesn't matter how I do in school, it's up to Miss Wiebeck. No matter what I do, she's just going to give me whatever grade. <laughs> ooh, ooh. I gotta slow down. <clears throat> Anyone have any other examples of external locus control, internal? Like things that you've seen people blame or you know they attribute to external focuses versus internal focuses? Well, there are some people that just like always blame, like they did bad on a test and they're always going to blame the teacher just because they never think it's their fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it might be. Sometimes you might land in a situation with the speech or something uh, where it might be completely out of your control. Mm -hmm. What? Who? Oh, did she? Yeah. She's gonna have a hard time paying that fine WNBA salary, but whatever. Five bucks a game. Five bucks a game. <laughs> um, ignore the little red box I have here for a second. I should have made that pop up. Let's talk about your self control. Um, we talked about this a little bit with the motivation chapter. The ability to control your impulses uh, and delay gratification is sometimes called willpower. So you have the ability to control your motivations. Um, this is a finite resource. Um, it can be replenished, uh, but you can deplete it in the short term. We talked about this with motivation uh, and hunger. Uh, people asked to resist eating cookies later, gave up and ate more cookies later. Um, Self-control is like a muscle. It's called self-regulatory failure, this whole process when your willpower fails. Um, the ability to control yourself is a muscle. It's a finite resource. You can overexert yourself um, in trying to control yourself, um, and then you get fatigued. 
with practice, you can obviously improve that. Um, it's just like a muscle. Self-control is just like a muscle. Uh, we can trace children or back to childhood and we can see differences in individuals with this sort of self-control. There are children that have um, better impulse control than others and that usually translates to their adulthood too. So if you know a child who has a really difficult time controlling themselves, controlling their behavior, controlling what they eat, what they say, with the, everything like that. You can see that in adulthood too. But it can improve and get better, just like a muscle. You can get stronger the more that you try to control yourself. Um, they did a study with marshmallows. Um, oh, yeah. The kids who resisted the temptation to eat marshmallows later had more success in school. Uh, social and were better socially that day. So because they exercised some sort of self-control during this marshmallow study, um, they were able to control themselves better in school. <laughs> what you say? It all makes sense now. Where do you like marshmallows? Yeah, I think they probably put them in a. I think they did the room with bowls of marshmallows there so the kids could see them and smell them and whatever, but they're like, don't eat any, don't eat any, don't eat any. So the kid had, like, Brennan had to stop himself from eating a marshmallow. So he went through the whole process of not trying to eat the marshmallows, and then later that day in school, he performed better. So perhaps if in the morning you were tempted with marshmallows and you didn't eat any, you would do better in school that day. What? We could try it some morning. I could bring you in here and have you stare at a whole bunch of donuts and marshmallows. So don't eat, like, and, then, <laughs> and then, yeah, don't, don't indulge so in marshmallows and then go to school and expect to be, yeah, I guess. We have a proven link that shows what the charms make kids stupid. It's true. Um, on the paper, that you guys are working on, it, it deals with optimism and pessimism. I'm going to skim over this slide, but um, whether or not you're an optimist or a pessimist can impact the uh, your stress. I'm not going to say a whole lot on this slide. I'm going to go to the next one instead. Um, but does anybody in here know without taking that the little quiz I gave you yesterday in the packet, I am an optimist, I am a pessimist. Does anyone think they are one or the other? Or, they, or do you think you're a realist right in the middle? Realist? I'm a pessimist. Oh. I'm a pessimist also. I try to see different things. Do you? Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't work. And then I convert like a realism. Anyone an always a glass half full, jolly, optimistic person? Can you think of someone that's an optimistic person? A jolly, always... Audrey, Miranda was very, yeah, Miranda was very, they make you mad. Happy people make you mad. Mitchell, I think you have issues. <laughs> um, all right, I like this chart, and I don't know what you want to write down about it, but it, it kind of shows you um, different thought processes and an excessive pessimist and excessive optimist, and then the middle and the realist. Um, so the excessive pessimist sees the situation, I can't do it, I might as well forget it. The excessive optimist, it won't be easy, um, it will be easy, I won't think about it. So this test is coming up, the pessimist says, oh, forget it, I didn't even study, it sucks, I'm not even going to do it, it doesn't even matter, pessimist, you know, totally uh, can't do it. Optimist, oh, the test is, is, is going to be easy. Um, I won't think about how tough it's going to be. The optimist is just like, yeah, whatever. Realist, it might be hard. I better plan for it. So uh, realist is you're kind of there in the middle. Um, excessive pessimist, I'm trapped. I can't get out of this sort of situation. The optimist, someone will rescue me. I mentioned this. It made me think of I had a, um, one of my best friends from high school, Allison. She went into a massive credit card debt when we were in college, like $7,000 of credit card debt, just, you know, shopping and buying cell phones. And she just kept like racking up all these things. 
And I said, what are you going to do about it? Like you have all these bills. She had no job. I was like, what are you going to, she's like, I, she's like, I just have a dream every night that someone will just pay my credit card bills for me. And I'm not worried about it. And I was like, how are you not worried about it? She's like, someone will pay them. And that was her, she was an excessive optimist who just was like, someone, someone will take care of it, not me. Someone will rescue me. Whereas I was like, this is a horrible situation and you're going to live the rest of your life in debt. Uh, the realist says, let's, let's make some changes and try to get out of that situation. Did she marry a really rich friend? No, no. She um, lost, uh, well, she, she had to move cities. She had to drop out of college. Um, her parents stopped talking to her for two years. Um, one of them, she, she had a boyfriend for like two weeks. He asked her if he, she would buy him a cell phone. So she bought him a cell phone. And then what do you know? He dumped her and ran off with the cell phone and then racked up all these bills on her. And she's like, oh, it doesn't matter. She's like, it's a horrible it situation. Matter. It doesn't matter. Um, I believe she had to go to counseling, like a, like a financial thing, and they had to walk through a plan because the credit card companies came after her and threatened to put her in jail. So then they had to take her to court, and she got like somebody in charge of her bank account. So she actually wasn't in charge of her bank account for about two or three years. Some like all of the purchases well, yeah, that she made. Someone, someone kind of did, or... yeah. Yeah. Which apparently is what you do, I guess, when you go into that much credit card debt. Like, like you get to the point of debt where you're like, I don't think I can get out of this, just go really far in debt so that everybody helps you out. Yeah. Cause I was like, I mean, it's hard for me to pay for stuff, but I'm not that much in debt. She was that much in debt where she just basically turned over all of her money to a financial planner who put her on an allowance like she was 12 years old. Are you kidding me? No. Yeah. He had a portion of whatever was, she was so in debt there wasn't even anything for him to take. But he took a portion of whatever, it took her about three or four years to dig out of the hole. And then she was fine. I hope she's not listening right now on YouTube. She probably is. I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, excessive pessimism. You're stressed out by your mom, your friend, your teammate. Uh, excessive pessimism. Uh, or your teacher. Uh, this teacher hates me. No matter what I do, uh, Mrs. Huff's just going to give me a bad grade because she hates me. Excessive optimist. Um, I'm sure he just wants to bet. I'll trust. I trust that teacher. Everything will be okay. And then the realist. Uh, I should ask how he feels about what he wants. Here's, the, here's your thing and the thing you should know about pessimism versus optimism, and you might be able to work this into your paper. Uh, excessive pessimism, if you are far to the pessimist side, it can leave you very depressed and feeling unactive and feeling like you're out of control and you have no control over your stressful situations um, because of that learned helplessness thing. You are in such a negative place that you cannot see any hope. But if you are way too hopeful, way too optimistic, it can leave you very unprepared and unsafe to deal with stressful situations. If you constantly think someone's just going to come in and rescue you from your <laughs> debt, it leaves you unprepared and unsafe for the rest of your life to get out of that same situation. If you always think that it'll be okay, if you never address the situation because you always think it's going to be okay, it can leave you unprepared when something actually does happen when the cops come to get you. What a dummy. Okay. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to get into this tomorrow, but I want to start it. We're going to talk about social support. Having close relationships is associated with improved health, immune function, and longevity, uh, living long. Um, so having close relationships of any kind is actually associated with health. Um, social support, and there's a whole little section in your textbook uh, that deals with pets, if you're a pet person. Um, they provide a calming effect that reduces blood pressure and stress hormones. There's a whole thing now, I think, is that what Retrieving Freedom, They part of what they do, um, provide companion animals to um, PTSD and autism, yeah, people that need a little more social support. Um, so animals do that. I like the, the cartoon. The man is stressed out and crying, and the dog says, well, I think you're wonderful. Why is he smiling? Well, because his dog says, I think you're wonderful. Makes him happy. 
Well, no, no, he was crying before. He was crying, and then he smiled. Can't you tell? We're in the halfway between point where he just got done crying and is now happy that his dog wasn't. Uh, yeah, we yeah, caught him at a dog is awkward in between face. So. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, confiding in others helps you manage your painful feelings. Sometimes you just got to vent. Sometimes it's just good to share those painful feelings or what you're feeling. Even though that person can do absolutely nothing about it, there's absolutely nothing that your pet can do to help you out with planning for college. There's absolutely nothing out, nothing that your best friend can help you with, with your mom or whatever's stressing you out. But sometimes just unleashing those painful feelings and confiding in people uh, takes away the stress from you, um, and it helps. And laughter also helps. Laughter actually is proven to be a pretty good medicine. So laughing is always good. And they, they um, put people that were under extremely stressful situations, and they made them fake laugh. They've done these studies where they put them in a chair and they make them like listen to a recording of laughter and they have to laugh around laugh with it even if they're not really no, laughing absolutely. it's very uh, it's like okay all of you try right now just to laugh like fake laugh uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right it's it's very awkward but they did these studies and even fake laughing having your body go through that process actually helped these people reduce their stress level just the fake laughter actually helped um, reduce their cortisol levels and reduce their stress. So if you're ever really, really super stressed and you're alone, because it, you might be weird if you're with other people, you're alone and you're really stressed out, fake laugh and you might feel better. And you'll feel very strange. Or just watch something funny. Or watch something funny also works. <laughs> I suppose that works too. No, it's oh always, God. it always. She has a thing where she just like smiles really big for just a long time until she's happy. Yeah. That's it's a thing. It's a, you can, yeah. I know you might feel weird, but you will really <laughs> feel better afterwards. Okay. Last thing we're going to talk about today is exercise and mental health. Gross. Um, aerobic exercise. Um, actually has been proven to reduce depression, anxiety, and improves your management of stress. There's countless studies about this, but you can see the one they list here. They have different individuals that took a depression test before treatment and after treatment. The red group had absolutely no treatment. They just tested their depression now and then a little bit later. Um, the blue group went through some sort of relaxation, like deep breathing, things like that. Um, and you can see their depression did go down, their depression scores. But the group that got aerobic exercise, look at how drastically it reduced their depression scores. So aerobic exercise and mental health are strongly linked together. If 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 you're focused on the actual doing of it, yes. But any aerobic exercise you can get, like even if it's even if it's just like flailing your arm, if it's some sort of aerobic activity, it's good for your body. If you're focused on the fact that, you know, you're looking around the gym and you look fatter than everybody else, then yes, that's not good for you. But just the actual exercise itself is good. Um, we're actually going to do that in a second, so don't don't laugh. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, one, there's a, the little dots here. Basically what they're saying is we don't know if it's causation, we just know it's correlated. Um, we don't know exactly if um, it's causation or correlation. But that's what you need to know. So after you're finished with whatever notes you want to take, go ahead and pack up and stand up. Would you rather dance or do yoga? Yoga. I already did yoga. Let's do yoga. Oh. Dance yoga. Or we could run the 400 hurdles, actually. <laughs> no, I don't. It, it's weird. <laughs> uh, do you want to do... Should we do flamingo? 
No, where's where's Dancing Bear? Eagle Pretzel. Let's do Eagle Pretzel. Oh, I know. He said he's going to tag like right at the end. Spencer is? I'm going to call him. He said he was going to. Oh, we need him to. No, tag. stand up. No, no stand up. Oh, he's God. I'm feeling so sorry. I am feeling so sorry. I'm feeling so sorry. I'm feeling so sorry. I'm feeling so sorry. I'm feeling so Turn this off. You were standing. I would rather lay in my bed. Oh, there it is. 